I'm thankful that I could be here today to share with you the word of God. We are in this series, Taste and See. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Psalm 34, 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And today's message is also on tasting and seeing. In particular, it is seeing the healing of Jesus on the lame, the blind, the crippled, and the mute. And also of tasting, tasting bread and fish. So let us start by reading the word of God. I'll be reading from the ESV translation, but you're welcome to open your pew Bible. We'll be reading from Matthew chapter 15, verses 29 to 39. May I invite you to all stand with me and we'll read the word of God together. Jesus went on from there and walked beside the Sea of Galilee. And he went up on the mountain and sat down there. And great crowds came to him, bringing with them the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. And they put them at his feet, and he healed them. So that the crowd wondered, when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled healthy, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, they glorify the God of Israel. Then Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I am unwilling to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. And the disciples said to him, Where are we to get enough bread in such a desolate place to feed so great a crowd? And Jesus said to them, How many loaves do you have? They said, Seven, and a few small fish. And directing the crowd to sit down on the ground, he took the seven loaves and the fish, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up seven baskets full of the broken pieces left over. Those who ate were 4,000 men, besides women and children. And after sending away the crowds, he got into the boat and went to the region of Magadha. This is the word of God. Thanks to God. Please be seated. This passage of Jesus feeding the 4,000 is less well known than the passage about Jesus feeding the 5,000. You know, fewer people and a little bit more loaves to start with and also fewer number of baskets left at the end. So we need to ask, why did Matthew record this episode as well when he had already talked about Jesus multiplying the loaves and the fish? In fact, this passage about Jesus feeding the 4,000 only appeared in Mark and Matthew, whereas Jesus feeding the 5,000 are recorded in all four Gospels. A lot of times we would then go to Mark because in Mark, it says more explicitly, more obvious, that while the 5,000 were Jews, the 4,000 are of Gentile descent. So we would bring that light and back into the Matthew passage. Because in Matthew, we're not so sure whether these 4,000 men plus women and children are Jews or Gentiles. But because of what we know from Mark, we would read Matthew in light of that. And we would find, we'd try to look for indications of these 4,000 being Gentiles. And we see that 
In the feeding of the 5,000, 12 baskets were leftovers, 12 tribes of Israel, where in the feeding of the 4,000, seven were leftovers. Seven represents a perfect number, hence all of God's creation, Jews and Gentiles. Or we may also notice that the crowds, they praised the God of Israel. And we might think, oh, these must not be Jews because they're praising the God of Israel. Whereas if Jews, they would say they praised their God. But then in the Bible, we also see that Jews refer to their God as God of Israel. Or we might just look at the context before and after the passage, and we notice that right before this passage, Matthew is talking about Jesus meeting the Canaanite woman. So we must be still in a Gentile context. So with that light, we look at this passage and we say, yes, the radical hospitality is to break our cultural norms, to step out of our comfort zone, to love and be hospitable and compassionate towards people who are not like us, who are different from us, maybe in their culture, maybe in their ethnicity, in their religion, or how they dress, how they talk, or how they live. But again, we need to ask, if Matthew had already talked about Jesus' hospitality and his love and compassion for the Canaanite woman, why did he put this message right after? If Matthew had already talked about Jesus multiplying for the 5,000, why did he put another one here? So maybe there's something more that we miss. So let us go to this passage again and look at the nuances and insights that Matthew is giving us through this passage. Let's start with verse 30. It says here, And great crowds came to him, bringing with them the lame, the blind, the crippled, and the mute, and many others. And they put them at his feet. Here, if you notice in this verse, Within this 4,000, and of course we know that it's just 4,000 men plus women and children, but within this group, there are actually two subgroups. They're the ones who need healing, the lame, the blind, the crippled, and the mute. These are the people who need Jesus to help them, to heal them. And then there's also their companions, the companions who brought their friends and family to come to Jesus, to bring their friends and family to Jesus for Jesus to heal them. Two groups of people within the 4,000, the sick and also the companions. And in verse 31, it says that, so that the crowd wondered when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled healthy, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorify the God of Israel. Here in particular is talking about the companions of the sick. They wondered when they saw the mute speaking, the cripple healthy, the lame walking, and the blind seeing. They saw and they wondered, or in other translations, and they marveled, or that they were amazed they were amazed at what they saw. What a spectacular sight. Jesus healed my friend. Jesus healed my family. Now, when we go into Jesus multiplying the loaves and the fish, which in itself is another spectacular sight, seven loaves of bread and some fish, and Jesus multiplied it, and 4,000 plus women and children they all ate. In verse 37, Matthew said, and they all ate and were satisfied. Notice here that Matthew did not say that they all saw Jesus multiplying the loaves and the fish and they were amazed. No, Jesus said they all ate. And that would include both the sick and their companions. They all ate and were satisfied. 
Now, let us look at each of these groups separately. We'll first look at the companions of the sick. They saw what Jesus did to their friends and they were amazed. They ate and they were satisfied. What's the difference between being amazed and being satisfied here? Amazed is, wow, I see what Jesus just did. Wow, what a spectacular sight. And, you know, being amazed at what they see in itself is worth all the praise and glory to God, as they did in Matthew 15, 31, that they glorified the God of Israel. But seeing what Jesus did to their friends and family, it remains a spectacular sight, an experience of the third person, an experience of the eye, something that they see happen to somebody else. But then it's different with the eating of bread and fish. They were satisfied, not just full, well, we can translate that word into full, but then in most translations, it's translated as satisfied. They were satisfied. I'm sure you know the difference between being full and being satisfied. Being full is, yep, I filled my tummy, good. But being satisfied is more than just a physical body feeling. Satisfied. They were satisfied in their heart and in their soul. The hospitality of Jesus, his compassion, his love, is not only to amaze the eye, but also to satisfy the soul. It's not just a third-person experience. It is also a first-person experience, a first-hand experience. Jonathan Edwards in his book, Religious Affections, he talks about knowing about honey versus tasting honey. He said that our experience of God needs to go beyond a, a speculative knowledge to a sensible knowledge. This is what he wrote. He that has perceived the sweet taste of honey knows much more about it than he who has only looked upon it and felt of it. Tasting the sweetness of God in our heart. Brothers and sisters, have you tasted the sweetness of God in your heart? Have you experienced firsthand being satisfied by Jesus' hospitality, his compassion, and his love to you? Or have you only experienced it as a third person seeing or listening or hearing some other people's testimony or reading it in the Bible. The hospitality of Jesus is not to amaze the eyes only. It is also to satisfy the soul. Next, let's go into the group of people who were sick and were healed by Jesus. Now, Maybe you too have experienced firsthand something amazing in your own life, just like what they did. The mute now speaking, the cripple healthy, the lame walking, and the blind seeing. Maybe God has saved you in a car accident, that he had healed you from a deadly disease, or he restored a dead relationship, or led you to a new job. And like those you know, in the 4,000 who were healed by Jesus, this is definitely both amazing and satisfying. This is a mountaintop experience that you would never forget and that you would keep testifying for the rest of your life. God intervenes in those special moments of great needs. But how about your everyday, ordinary, simple, mundane lives? like eating bread and fish. I mean, when you read this passage, Jesus did not turn water into wine. He did not change the bread and the fish into steak 
and a five-course meal. He just multiplied it, and they ate, and they were satisfied. The hospitality of Jesus is not only for special moments of great needs. It is also for our ordinary, mundane lives. Now, if you can only see Jesus' hospitality in those special moments um, in your life, you can only see Jesus' hospitality in those times of great needs, be careful because it might mean that you're not being sensitive to God's work in your everyday life, or even that you only trust God in big things, that you only go to God in big things, and you feel that, oh, I can handle everyday life. I can handle like simple mundane things. I don't need God. Be careful, because this is an indication of your pride. Like we sang this morning, we surrender all to Jesus. Do you surrender all to Jesus? It is sometimes easier to surrender the big things to Jesus because I can't do it. Well, I have to go to God for it. But how about the little things, the simple things, the mundane things? Do you also surrender that to Jesus? Do you also trust Jesus? The hospitality of Jesus is not only for special moments of great needs, but also for our ordinary mundane days. Finally, when we look at this passage, in the feeding of this 4,000 people, men and plus women and children, it's a little bit different from the passage in the feeding of the 5,000 in that the issue of food was not brought by the disciples or the people, but by Jesus himself. In Matthew 15, 32, it says, Then Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on the crowd, because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I am unwilling to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. It is not the needs of the crowd that creates or brings about a compassion in Jesus. It is other, rather the other way around. It is Jesus' compassion that let him see the need, says that Jesus is unwilling to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. Jesus' heart goes out to them. He's unwilling or not desiring them to suffer. The hospitality of Jesus is not about who the recipient is or what their needs are, but it is about who the giver, Jesus, is. We see and hear about the needs of many people around us, but that will not create a compassion and hospitality, hospitality in us. It is only when we have the compassion of Jesus we will recognize the needs of those around us. And it is only when we have the hospitality of Jesus that we will share God's love with them, for them to taste the goodness of God through us. This is the love of God. It is a spreading goodness for us to taste and see. It is like a fountain that keeps flowing. And it is not just a spectacular sight to look at but it is to satisfy your heart. It is not just for special moments of great needs, but it is also for everyday, ordinary moments. After first service, I went into the ladies' room and you know, met a few ladies there, and then we started chatting and sharing God's greatness and goodness in our lives. And one lady even shared that she actually found a job or got a job offer in the ladies' room. Not today, but some time ago. <laughs> so yes, you know, God works all the time, everywhere. Not just at special moments of great needs, not just in the sanctuary, but in your everyday mundane lives and even in the ladies' room. And God's love 
It doesn't depend on who we are or what we need. God just loves pouring his love into us. Romans 5, 5, it says, you know, the love of God is poured into our hearts through the spirit every day, every moment, everywhere. And it's so much that the love of God not only fills us and satisfies us, but it will also flow out of us to people around us. Do not think that this is just to teach us to be hospitable. Do not think that it is just to set an example for us that we need to be like Jesus. Without the love of God in, our, in us, in our hearts, we cannot love others. Without the compassion and hospitality of God, without us first tasting and experiencing God's love, we cannot share his love with others. It is only when we have tasted the goodness of God in our lives, in our heart, that we can share this love and other people can taste the goodness of God through us. Have you tasted the spreading goodness of God? Have you experienced firsthand God's love, his compassion, and his hospitality? Have you tasted his goodness this morning? Are you tasting the goodness of God right now? And is it so much that it fills you and satisfies you that you cannot help but spread it to those around you? Let us pray. At this time, I invite you to quiet down before God and just ask him to fill your hearts with his love, which he is doing and he has been doing, but maybe we're just not sensitive to it. Let us just take a few moments to taste the goodness of God. Father, I thank you because you are hospitable, you are compassionate, and you are love. We love because you first loved us. By ourselves, we're selfish, we're limited. We can offer very little, but Christ lives in us and the Spirit transforms us to be like Christ as the Spirit pours the spreading goodness of God into our hearts that we too can love and we too can be hospitable to others. Help us, Father, to experience your love, to not only see, but also taste your goodness in big and small things. And help us to be sensitive to the Spirit's prompting so that we too can recognize the needs around us and share your love with our family, our friends, and our community so that they too can taste and see your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.